Kayaking, a beloved pastime for outdoor enthusiasts, offers unparalleled access to nature's breathtaking landscapes, but it often brings individuals into proximity with formidable predators. Venturing through the crocodile-infested waters of the Amazon, or paddling along ocean coasts where tiger sharks lurk, kayakers find themselves in the domain of creatures with lethal instincts. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we go over three times kayakers were fatally mauled by wild animals. Welcome to Final Affliction. Boyfriend and girlfriend Roy Stoddard and Tamara McAllister were two 24-year-olds who met whilst teaching in the same school in West Malibu, California. They initially bonded over their sense for adventure. Tamara was preparing for public health work in Kenya as part of her master's degree. Roy turned his hand to anything from mountain climbing, biking, and surfing to scuba diving and kayaking. The two of them spent all their spare time hiking, camping, and kayaking together. On Thursday, January 26, 1989, the couple were training for a triathlon that they were planning on competing in together. In preparation for the upcoming race, they kayaked and swam daily. Their usual route took them on a three-mile round trip from Latigo Point to Paradise Cove. They each took a single-man kayak into the water on that fateful day. They headed down to the water just before 9 a.m. Pausing on the sand, they both sat down and enjoyed a hot cup of coffee and a muffin to kickstart their day. A passerby saw them launch at 9.30 before they paddled northwards around Latigo Point and on towards Paradise Cove. It was like any of their other training days. The couple were happy and excited to spend the time together. The wind was light and the seas were fairly calm. As they paddled into the sea that day, they were never to return again. There were no further sightings of the couple alive. Tamara's body was found two days later. This story is based on the findings and subsequent report by the case investigator Ralph Collier. The following is one of the number of possibilities that could have happened to the couple and is based on circumstantial evidence. After finishing their coffee, they put on their windbreakers and zipped them up over their swimsuits. These were blue and black wetsuit style jackets that kept them warm on the open water. As the wind was picking up, there was a chill in the air. The couple paddled to about 100 yards out, remaining shoreside of the kelp beds. They knew it was safer not to paddle beyond the kelp forests, as more often than not, they act as a natural deterrent to sharks. After heading around Latigo Point, the wind buffeted them. It whipped the surface of the sea, the salt spray wetting their faces and stinging their eyes. They bowed their heads against it, digging in and persevering. The training route usually took them 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how long they stopped for a swim at the halfway point. Today, it was taking them a bit longer. They lashed their kayaks together as Tamara was being blown off course. The momentary pause in paddling gave them a breather and some respite. They decided to continue. Roy made headway in the lead kayak, cutting a wake for Tamara to follow. He felt the tugging of the rope every so often as it went taut, pulling Tamara back on course. It wasn't long before they could see their halfway destination, Paradise Cove. But they never made it. Suddenly, without warning, there was a tremendous smash from below the water. Something from the depths torpedoed upwards and struck the boats from underneath. The two of them were thrown from their kayaks and slammed into the sea. Tamara resurfaced, coughing and sputtering unsure of what had just happened. Seconds later, she felt a tremendous tug on her left thigh and was pulled underwater. Kicking and thrashing around, she desperately tried to pull herself to the surface, but a shark had a strong grip of her leg. She could feel her lungs about to burst as the shark twisted and turned underwater. Roy had knocked his head on his kayak when he had been thrown into the ocean. Dazed and dizzy, he frantically blinked, trying to make sense of the situation. Seconds later, he heard the terrified screams of his girlfriend as she momentarily resurfaced. He wheeled around to see a sea of red and their upturned kayaks bobbing in the water. He immediately swam over to the commotion and managed to grab Tamara's hand. Pulling her above the surface of the water, she gasped for breath. 
He held on to her, trying desperately to pull her to the boats. The hulls of the kayaks were wet and slippery. Each time he tried to grab on, his hand would slip. He lifted one side, trying to flip it back over, but the weight was immense, and whilst holding on to Tamara with one arm, he didn't have the strength to right the boat. He tried again and again. The commotion in the water was witnessed by Margaret Bloom. As she looked out of her living room windows at 10.15 that morning, she noticed an incredible boiling of the water and thrashing about. It was out past the kelp beds near a large United States Coast Guard buoy. She spotted a number of seals leap out of the water onto the surface of the buoy, avoiding the churning sea. They were anxious and agitated. It is unclear whether this commotion was a shark attacking one of the seals or whether it was the actual attack on Tamara and Roy. If it was the former and had unsuccessfully caught a seal, the same shark may have turned its attention to the kayaks a few moments later. As Roy held on to Tamara, keeping her afloat, he could feel her slipping away. The shark had severed her femoral artery and she was bleeding out. But the shark hadn't finished yet. It returned and in a frantic attack, it took hold of Roy and dragged him underwater, never to be seen again. When the couple didn't show up to work the next day, their friends and colleagues raised the alarm. People knew that Tamara and Roy had taken the kayaks out and they knew their routine paddle. The kayaks were found the day after the attack. They were floating and upturned less than 20 miles from where the couple had paddled, on the opposite side of Santa Monica Bay. The kayaks had stress fractures along their holes and one had a hole in the bow. On examination of this evidence, an engineer suggested that significant impact and force would cause this kind of damage. The object that struck the kayaks needed to have been in excess of 2,000 pounds or 900 kilograms and traveling at least 17 knots. These are characteristics of a great white shark. These incredible apex predators are also known to attack their prey from behind or from underneath, often shooting out of the water as they do so. The following day, the crew of a sailing boat found Tamara's body floating in the water. The current had carried her 30 miles north of Paradise Cove, near Channel Islands Harbor. She was still wearing her jacket, which suggests that she wasn't swimming when she was attacked. Her injuries included deep bite wounds to her upper thighs. One had severed her femoral artery and vein, and the other measured more than 34 centimeters or 13 inches in diameter. She had bruising to her hand and head, possibly from being thrown from her kayak. From the size of the bite marks and severity of the injuries, it was concluded that a great white shark measuring at least five feet long had been the cause of the fatality. Following the discovery of Tamara's body, the United States Coast Guard conducted a search and rescue operation by both boat and helicopter to try and find Roy. After a week-long search, no trace of him was ever found. This devastating attack happened within sight of the shore, and yet no one witnessed it. The young couple were both fit and adventurous. Although Tamara was new to kayaking, Roy had been on the water since childhood, and both were exceptional swimmers. Their lives were cut tragically short, simply doing what they loved. While the ocean and its beaches provide us with some of nature's greatest playgrounds, we must remember that this is the shark's habitat, not ours. And despite how experienced and prepared you might be, one encounter with these murderous creatures can lead you to your unfortunate final affliction. Henry Coetzee always knew death was coming for him. He often spoke of it, knowing his adventurous lifestyle was pushing him to his premature end. But his cravings for adventure overcame him. In his memoirs, he wrote of feeling a deep depression as soon as each expedition was over. He was only ever happy when he was alone, pushing himself to his limits and way beyond. Hendry grew up in South Africa. He found school tedious and boring, but thrived in the arts. After graduating, he went traveling before joining the military. At the age of 21, he was back on the dark continent and was looking for adventure. In 1997, the mighty Zambezi River, bordering Zambia and Zimbabwe, was fast becoming a hotspot for thrill-seeking tourists. Outfitters set up bungee jumps and skydives over the awesome Victoria Falls, but most popular of all was whitewater rafting. As a cocky 21-year-old Hendry, who had never kayaked or rafted a river in his life, landed himself a job with Peter Meredith's Whitewater Rafting Company. 
After learning how to roll and ride a kayak in a swimming pool, Hendry took to one of the world's most advanced commercial rivers. He guided tourists through grade 5 rapids and quickly became a popular guide. Peter described Hendry as having more balls than brains and on one occasion, whilst the entire group portaged their rafts and kayaks around a deadly class 6 rapid, Hendry ran at it in his kayak without telling anyone. He barely made it through, but thought he was the bee's knees. Peter warned him he'd be fired if he ever pulled a stunt like that again. Peter and Hendry became good friends. In 2004, they embarked on an epic adventure with a small team. The task was to follow the River Nile from source to sea. They paddled the 4,130 miles from Lake Victoria to the Mediterranean together. This preceded Hendry's solo paddle of the Congo a few years later. The journey took him five months to complete. He survived being ambushed and hunted by cannibalistic Gombe tribesmen. He dodged hippos and crocodiles. He slept on the banks of the river, protected only by his bivouac and the flames of his fire. After returning home, Hendry decided that it was time to settle down. This adventurous lifestyle couldn't last forever, and he was taking too many risks. He had met a girl and realized that there was perhaps more to life than adrenaline-filled expeditions. But these feelings weren't to last long. In 2010, an email pinged in his inbox. Two professional American kayakers, Ben Stokesbury and Chris Korbelik, wanted to navigate the upper Congo River. They knew Hendry was the perfect guide for the job. Hendry stood fast on his original decision, no more kayaking or exploration, but he was happy to help them plan their route. He wrote a detailed itinerary for them, adding detail that only an explorer of his caliber would know. As he mapped out their journey, Hendry felt that familiar restlessness return. The call of the wild echoed once more in his ears. After months of helping them plan their trip, Hendry finally relented and succumbed to the promise of an epic adventure. The trio set out on the two-month trip through the Congo's tributaries. They began along the Ruzizi River at the end of October 2010. They planned to be home by Christmas. Hendry's girlfriend was looking forward to seeing him again after what he promised to be his final expedition. It turns out, he was right. Whenever the three kayakers paused along the river to rest or make camp, they would speak with locals who lived on the riverbanks. They had an agreement with the International Rescue Committee, who helped refugees and rural communities. In exchange for some logistical help, Hendry had promised feedback from locals. Upon speaking to one community, they were told that, as well as needing clean water and education, they also needed help tackling a major crocodile problem. In the past 20 years, 125 people had been taken by this prolific predator. Hendry and the other made a mental note of this comment. What they didn't know was the years of battles in the region between neighboring communities had resulted in more than 5.4 million people being killed. Most of these people had been dumped in the rivers. Most of these people had been eaten by crocodiles. As a result, these reptilian beasts had grown to enormous sizes and had a taste for human blood. On December 7, 2010, the trio had been paddling for some time when they came to a sharp bend in the river. Although Ben and Chris were professional paddlers and well known in the world of extreme sports, Hendry had to teach them how to kayak in the African wilderness. He taught them to regularly tap their kayaks to create noise, stay away from eddies where hippos might attack, and keep clear of sunbathing crocodiles on the riverbanks. On the day of the attack, the three of them had spotted a few three-foot crocodiles on the muddy banks. They were harmless and the trio glided by, admiring the natural scene from their plastic boats. If a larger croc was spotted in the water, protocol was for the three kayakers to come together and paddle as fast as they could to outrun the potential threat. So far, the journey had been broken up into hair-raising whitewater obstacles and calm, gentle stretches that meandered silently through the still African bush. Around the corner, the river was about a hundred feet wide and flowed gently. The three men were paddling close to one another. They had to concentrate so that their blades didn't touch. Ben was slightly in front, Hendry in the center, and Chris trailing a few yards behind. Ben's eyes darted from left to right as he scanned the waterways and sloping embankment for any sign of trouble. The water was so calm with the only ripples emanating from the men's paddles. There were no telltale signs of predatory crocodiles or territorial hippos. 
Usually, they would spot the knobby protrusions of a crocodile's log-like head and two gleaming eyes just above the water's surface, but today was different. Unbeknownst to them, something was stirring underwater. Something was stalking them from the murky depths. Nothing could have alerted them to this stealthy predator. Not a ripple, nor a bubble, until it was too late. Ben looked back over his shoulder to check the others were keeping form. As he did so, he saw an enormous crocodile silently emerge from the water just to Hendry's left-hand side. Hendry gasped at its sudden appearance and cried, Oh my God! It wasn't a cry of fear, terror, or desperation. It was more a matter-of-fact exclamation. To suddenly see the biggest crocodile lift its head out of the water had taken Hendry completely by surprise. Those were the only words he managed to shout. In an instant, the crocodile had grabbed Hendry's left shoulder in its jaws. It pulled him underwater, quickly, like lightning. The immense pressure from a bite force of over 4,000 psi seized Hendry, crushing his chest and neck. Hendry was fastened snugly into the cockpit of his kayak. Ben and Chris watched in abject terror as the upturned kayak shook and tumbled above the water for a few agonizing seconds. Then the kayak was pulled downwards and out of sight. Moments later, the red plastic boat bobbed back up to the surface and righted itself. The cockpit was empty. Hendry was nowhere to be seen. Hendry was likely to have been taken to the bottom of the river where the crocodile began its feast. Knocking the air from his lungs, disorientating him with sharp twists and rolls in an attempt to drown its prey. Mercifully, Hendry likely passed out from the immense compression on his body before being taken down under. Judging by the size of its head, the crocodile was estimated to be about 15 feet long, weighing in excess of 2,000 pounds. Ben and Chris made a mad dash for it. Paddling with all their might, they churned through the green Lukuga River. Frantically, they made their way to the riverside village of Kabea Maji. Firing their kayaks at the riverbank, they leapt out and ran into the village, shouting for help. The locals fled in a mad panic. The two white men, donning life jackets and helmets, had taken them completely by surprise. But when everyone had calmed down, Ben and Chris managed to ask for a motorboat to go and look for Hendry. The villagers shuffled uneasily and shook their heads. They told them that they no longer set foot on the river, because in the last five years alone, seven of them had been taken by the crocodiles, simply plucked from the decks of their boats. Ben and Chris dashed onto a nearby bridge, desperately looking upstream for their fallen friend. The entire village, some 200 people, followed them. Then they saw something. From around the corner, something floated into view. A black paddle, and then Hendry's red kayak bobbed up and down on the river, floating closer and closer, and then passing under the bridge, right beneath Ben and Chris's feet. It was immaculate, no sign of a struggle, no scratches, no cracks, no blood. Hendry was never seen again. Sensing something wasn't right, Hendry's girlfriend logged onto Facebook. Her heart skipped a beat as messages of condolence for Hendry appeared on her screen. This couldn't be happening. This must be some kind of mistake. They were supposed to be meeting soon. He was nearing the end of his expedition, his very last expedition. Distraught and devastated, Hendry's girlfriend still journeyed to the Ugandan bar on New Year's Eve, where they were planning on meeting. Through the dimmed lighting and steady bass beat of the music, she searched the hazy dance floor for Hendry. Still hoping upon hope that she would see that dazzling, confident smile pop up from the crowds. The clock struck 12, the partygoers erupted in cheers, but Hendry was nowhere to be seen. He had met his unfortunate final affliction. Maurice Speed Phillips left from Narua Wahia, situated in the Waikato region of New Zealand, and made the almost two-hour drive to Auckland. Maurice and Rion were both 24, and they were planning on spending the weekend in Auckland, staying with some of Maurice's relatives. Narua Wahia had lots of rivers and streams that the friends frequented with their kayaks almost every weekend. But by now, after two years rowing together, Rion and Maurice knew the tributaries like the back of their hands. They knew the best fishing spots, and quite frankly, it was getting boring fishing in the fresh water. Auckland had a wide open ocean, and the fit young men wanted to see how far they could push themselves out on the open waters. 
The rivers and streams were fast, exciting, and offered a lot of rapids for a kayaker to navigate. That held its own attraction, but neither of them had ever gone out with the intent to fish in the open waters before. The fish were bigger and harder to reel in while keeping your balance, so the outing was almost sure to be a challenging one. Besides, it was nearly Christmas, so they wanted to see if the girls at the beach were prettier than the ones back home. They took Friday off work and arrived in the early morning, spending the whole day looking for good places to set out from. Auckland has its fair share of rowing enthusiasts, so there were plenty of places to choose from. They even tried out the waters that afternoon, just to see how the currents were different and what to expect when you hit a small wave. At the end of the day, they decided to set out from the harbor, where the waters had the fewest waves. The waves died down as soon as you got a few meters in, but that first stretch of choppy ocean was an unfamiliar experience for both. So they decided that it was best to choose the calmest place they'd come across on that first day. They headed to bed early, after being piled with third helpings from Maurice's aunt's excellent cooking, and rose before the sun was even up the next morning. They'd left the car, packed with their kayaks and fishing gear the night before, so they only needed to get dressed and take their packed lunch before leaving. Maurice's aunt was kind enough to pack a cooler full of refreshments and a huge lunch for them the night before. There was so much food that they had some of it for breakfast on the way to the harbor, and when they couldn't eat any more, they still had three quarters left of Tupperware to devour later that afternoon. The sun had risen by the time they got to their destination, and the air was still chilly when they lowered their crafts into the shallows. Each would man his own kayak. There wasn't much room already, and what little space each of them had was taken up by bait and tackle boxes. Rion had a rocky start. He nearly capsized twice before they were even out of the harbor. Every time he hit even the smallest swell, his kayak wobbled dangerously. But it was all smooth sailing once they were out past the ships and yachts that were anchored behind them. Nevertheless, they made it out and had their lines in the water in no time. There were a number of other kayakers on the outskirts of the harbor. A lot of them retired individuals who still had enough oomph in them to keep themselves fit. A few old-timers stopped to give the young guns some advice on the fine art of fishing, and their advice seemed to work fabulously. Soon, Maurice's bucket was overflowing with the shiny silver bodies of fish. The older gentlemen sure knew what they were talking about. They still had a long day left on the water, so he decided to throw some of the smaller ones back into the ocean to make some room for a few, hopefully bigger fish. That was a terrible mistake. The fish, all with bleeding wounds left behind by the hooks that grabbed them up, attracted an even bigger fish, a ten-foot great white. She'd been skimming the water for a while, unsure what the fiberglass shapes of the kayaks above her were. At first, she thought they were sea lions, but they moved a little too strangely to be sea lions, so she held off hunting them just yet. The smell of blood that Maurice was chucking over the side of his boat was enough for her to throw all caution into the wind. Something alive was bleeding, and she wanted a piece. Her streamlined body moved through the depths, straight at Maurice's kayak. She opened her mouth to grab the closest fish that were about to swim back into the deep but her speed was such that she rammed right into Maurice's craft. Like lightning, a dark shape rose out of the water, right in front of Maurice. Before he could comprehend what was happening, the kayak tipped sideways, throwing the man and the contents of his boat into the water. Maurice's head went under just as he uttered a scream. When he came up, Maurice made for the upside-down kayak, and he was close enough to reach it in just a few strokes. His hands immediately clawed at the hull, attempting to pull himself up. He was so frantic to get out of the water that the warning screams from Rion did not even register in his ears. Maurice started to pull himself out of the water, but his relief was premature. Before he could swing his leg up and out, it was yanked down from beneath him. Maurice's grip on the kayak stayed firm, but the immense heave from below just pulled his head under again, and he flipped the kayak the right way up before being torn off the hull. Rion was there, screaming for help. 
He momentarily saw the gray creature's tail, and he tried to strike it with his oar. It was too late. As soon as the fin and tail appeared, it had already disappeared beneath the darkness, taking Maurice with it. Below, Maurice was being dragged down. He could feel the muscle and skin tearing away from the bone, being ripped and shredded as the animal's teeth sliced at him. The pain was unbearable, and he opened his mouth in a desperate and silent scream of agony. Water flooded his insides, and the air he released went up. Where Rion saw the red bubbles break the surface. His hysterical yells had almost a dozen boaters and kayakers racing toward them. Maurice's body was being pulled left and right. The creature was thrashing him ferociously, tearing away at his left thigh. All the while, she was dragging Maurice deeper and deeper. His lungs burned as much as his leg, and whether it was from a loss of blood or oxygen, Maurice's consciousness was beginning to fade to black. He was under the water for a full five minutes before his body bobbed to the surface just a few feet away from his kayak. He came up right in front of an elderly couple in a motorized boat who were racing toward the circle of locals who'd come to the rescue. But the rescue was too late. The old man fished the younger one out of the sea, with his wife grabbing his belt to keep him from falling overboard with the weight. The shark had gotten away with half of Maurice's thigh, severing the main artery. She'd bitten in so deep that the stark white bone was visible, even through all the blood and shredded muscle. Rion had somehow managed to stay upright in his kayak throughout the whole ordeal. But when he saw his friend's blank, staring eyes, he keeled over backwards and fainted right into the canoe of a middle-aged man who'd stopped next to him. The people of Auckland took both men to the shore, where one was taken to the hospital and the other to the morgue. The animal didn't return to the harbor, nor was she sighted there again. The usual rowers decided to take a break that Christmas. It was well into the next year before any of them were brave enough to board their vessels again. They all knew the man-eating great white shark was still out there, waiting to bring another innocent person to their terrifying final affliction. Oh!